Getting reliable power to every corner of this province is far from a done deal. But an effort underway to connect remote First Nations communities to the grid offers new hope. Joining us now for more, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Christopher Henderson. He's president of Loomis Energy and the author of Aboriginal Power, Clean Energy and the Future of Canada's First Peoples. And from Casabonica Lake, Ontario, via Skype, Mitchell Diabo. He is Projects Manager, Casabonica Lake First Nation, and a representative on the board of Wate Power. And as I welcome you both back to the program, Mitch, why don't you just tell us where you are right now? Because I suspect a lot of Ontarians don't know where Casabonica Lake is. We are 500 kilometers north, straight north of Thunder Bay. So we're fairly high up in the province, in the remote area of uh, the province, and uh, pretty close to the coastline, uh, Hudson Bay coastline. Um, all you'll find up there is Fort Severn First Nation above us, and that's it. Gotcha. Okay, thank you for that location. And now let's, just to set up our discussion, we want to play this little setup pack, which I think will explain the issues nicely, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, roll it if you would. There are 25 remote First Nations reserves in Ontario that are not connected to the provincial electrical grid. Instead, they rely on diesel generators for electricity, and those generators require fuel to be trucked, shipped, or flown in. One major piece that is constraining many of these communities from moving forward and growing, according to Ontario Regional Chief Isidore Day, is that they don't have reliable power. Impacts include diesel spills, one liter of fuel oil can contaminate a million liters of drinking water. Power surges, which can damage computer systems and medical equipment. Blackouts, which can shutter schools and community centers and leave residents without a grocery store for hours on end. A reliance on wood-burning stoves, which can cause respiratory issues, especially among infants. Not having enough power to build new homes or community infrastructure. And, in one instance, having to close the local hockey rink in the middle of the season. Hopes for reliable energy come in the form of the Watay Transmission Project, a $1.35 billion First Nations owned transmission line that will connect 17 of these 25 remote communities. There are two phases to the project. Phase one is a reinforcement of an existing line from Ignace to Pickle Lake. It's slated to be completed by the year 2020. Phase two will connect the 17 remote First Nations communities to the provincial electrical grid. 1,500 kilometers of transmission line will extend the grid through two main arteries, Red Lake and Pickle Lake. The end of the line is scheduled to be completed by the year 2023. But reliable energy could come sooner for those reserves located further south. The project, once completed, is expected to provide reliable and clean energy for more than 10,000 people. Let's pick up there. Mitch, I wonder whether you can relate to the notion of not having enough electricity in place to develop your community. Can you relate to that? Oh, absolutely. Up until December 2015, we spent a decade on load restrictions under Hydro One Remote Communities, Inc., where we were maxed out on our diesel plant. So we were under the guise of swapping uh, assets on the distribution system, taking out old houses to connect new houses, uh, disconnecting uh, commercial buildings that were unused or underutilized to connect new houses. So we were swapping assets around for a while and not really building anything new in that in that decade. Let me jump in and ask about uh, what happened last year. You got some of your generators upgraded. What did that allow you to do that you couldn't do previously? Well, now we've got, uh, we're running full bore on housing programs. So each year we're building 10 to 12 new units and we're in our second year of a, what we call an accelerated housing program to take advantage of that extra power. We've reconnected a lot of those facilities we took out of distribution when we were swapping in that decade. So for example, we built a small business center which contains a motel, restaurant, uh, contractors, bunkhouse. We reconnected a Telesat building which was uh, given to us by Telesat when they vacated the community uh, two years ago. So uh, we're reconnecting things and building new things. Chris, give us a sense across a broader spectrum of how many different aspects of life are affected when you don't have adequate electricity for your community. Well, Steve, what you're going to find if you're on a diesel system, every aspect of your life is affected by it. You have to make sure the diesel systems operate. Sometimes, as Mitch has mentioned, you have outages or you have blackouts that can last for days, sometimes even longer. 
And, and, and the quality of power is also not very good with the diesel system. It's two-phase power, and the, the power we get in the main grid is three-phase. It's better quality. So what you find is that for day-to-day -day life, for your homes, for your heating, for your business operations, for the community operations, you're completely rel reliant on diesel power. You're thinking about it all the time. And remember, you also have to look about electricity and heat. And so what you find in a, in a remote diesel community is that power consumes the community at times. Let's just remind everybody that about 15 months ago, when the federal election campaign was in full swing, Justin Trudeau, then the leader of the Liberal Party, which was in third place, said, the Liberal government will work with Indigenous peoples to create fairness and equality of opportunity in Canada. And my question, Chris, to you first is, are fairness and equality of opportunity in Canada possible if you don't have access to reliable energy? Well, no, it's going to be tough, but the good news is that what we've seen over the last couple of years is the government, including the Liberal government since it's been elected, has really tried to say how could they promote clean energy in Indigenous communities around the country. There are a number of supportive programs in place, and now the real look is at diesel communities. The real focus that we're seeing across the country, in Ontario, other provinces, and certainly in the part of the federal government, is what can we do to diminish the reliance on diesel fuel. Mitch, how about it? Can you have fairness? and equality of opportunity without a reliable source of electricity? Well, well I'd like to say uh, I appreciate that message of hope uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is, is giving to our communities. However, there's a bit of a reality check that's required there. Do we have the infrastructure to support um, extra units, housing units, uh, expanded nursing stations, whatever sort of facilities he's promising. Do we have the necessary infrastructure to support those facilities? And that's a reality check that's required. Those communities need to know that they have that, uh, that companion infrastructure as well. Well, let me follow up on that reality check because in the federal budget, which came out earlier this year, they did commit, the Liberal government did, $8.4 billion over five years to bring about what it called transformational change for Canada's Indigenous people, and that meant a billion two to build new homes and child care centres and nursing stations on reserves and so on. Mitch, is this funding useful if you haven't got electricity to keep the lights on in all of those new facilities? Not, not for those communities that are maxed out on diesel-generated power, obviously. If they don't have the power, the uh, distribution company, and in our case, Hydro One Remote Communities, is not going to connect any facilities. Uh, we've gone through that for 10 years, and we couldn't connect a thing unless we swap things out. So are those communities prepared to, to play a swapping game, and, and do they have enough uh, to pull out of distribution to hook up a nursing station, hmm. for example? Let me get a sense of how optimistic or not the two of you are about some of those markers we put down in the setup piece that started our discussion. For example, the Wate Power Project that's going to connect 17 remote communities slated to be completed by the year 2023. Chris, do you think they'll make it on time? I think they will, and, there, and here's why. First of all, this is an indigenous partnership. 17 communities coming together, and in fact, I expect another four or five to join by the time it's finally done. In addition, we've had strong support to, for this project from the Ontario government and very open consideration of the federal government's part. There's a desire that they can make a huge impact to take 10,000 people off diesel connected to the grid now, and the ability there is to do it. I think what's the real core here is Indigenous leadership. This is not a private proponent doing it or a government department. This is Indigenous communities coming together on seeing how they can make a more durable, sustainable future for themselves. So I'm not only hopeful, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic that the, the, the stars are coming aligned here to change the future for electricity in Northern Ontario. I want to find out if Mitch thinks the stars are aligned because when you were on this program half a year ago, you were not optimistic at all about hitting that target. How about now? I'm optimistic and I agree with a lot of what Chris says. Uh, the issues I had was the time frames. Uh, right now, we're, in, we're looking at the phase one piece of the project and to get that into play by by 2020, we've got a construction season of three to four years, and we're getting pretty darn close to get this phase one started in order to get it on. Uh, phase two from there is, is a massive undertaking. It's unprecedented in our area. We're talking about five kilometer wide corridor uh, corridors being planned for 1,500 kilometers. That's a lot of trap lines. That's a lot of communities, a lot of hunters, gatherers, members from all these communities impacted and we talk about the overlap occurring uh, phase two environmental assessment is going to be massive Chris let me check in with you on the issue of those communities which actually sit closer to the existing grid line for example the Pekanjikum First Nation 
it's, it's 90 kilometers away, I think, from the existing uh, line in Red Lake. So is it possible they could get there before 2023? Uh, yes, I think it's very possible. And in fact, there seems to be strong agreement between the federal and the provincial government that that Picanjigum should be a focus. It's a community that uh, at one time was slated to be a grid connected about five years ago. And I think you'll see that project go first. But let me say something about timeline, Steve. Let me give you a marker on this. In World War II, there was no highway to Alaska. So they decided to build a highway to Alaska to make sure they had a landline to that, to that part of North America in the time of World War II in the Pacific. So they built 1,500 kilometers of road that didn't exist at all in nine months through the Arctic winter. It, it's all about the will here. I believe both the timeline and, and the will to change exists now. Can we make it by 2023? No, but we'll see communities like Picanjicum go first. And I believe if the will is there, we will get there. This is an issue that we can solve. Mitch, I want to ask you a couple of really boring governance questions here, but there are a couple of things I don't quite get, and I need you to explain them to me. The transmission line is going to hook up 17 off-grid communities, but it's going to be owned by 22 First Nations communities. Why the difference? Well, there's some communities now who are already connected to grid, and the reason why they joined the partnership is because they claim rights and interests to traditional lands where the existing grid uh, crosses through those lands and where our, our second line going to Pickle Lake is going to cross those lands. So they assert rights and interests that will be impacted um, even though they're not necessarily customers of the line. And Chris, let me follow up with you on this one. Uh, we've seen in the province of Ontario at Queen's Park where governments are elected for four years and you've essentially got the same leadership in place for those four years, uh, how difficult it can be to rebuild an electricity system. Uh, you have 22 First Nations at the table. There are two-year election cycles for the chief and the council. What kind of challenges do, does that pose to getting the governance on this right? Well, the communities have made a decision to be a part of Wate, and those decisions are, are permanent. They can't be changed just because a new chief and council comes in. They're making a decision as a community to make, uh, to make an investment and participation in the Wate partnership. There may be some communities that will change their mind, but we've had changes in leadership in some of those communities since the Wate partnership was formed, and they haven't rescinded or withdrawn from the partnership. It seems to indicate to me that the support is there. And in fact, if you look virtually quarter by quarter over the last three years, more communities have come on board with the Wate project. So while I agree with you, community changes in leadership are an issue, the reality is that what seems to be getting people galvanized is this is where they want to go and they want to stay involved. And the only way you can stay involved is if you don't withdraw from the partnership. Okay, Chris, let me do another follow-up with you. The agency that is responsible for planning Ontario's transmissions lines, that's the IESO, the Independent Electricity System Operator, has said that connecting 21 of the province's 25 remote reserves would result in a billion dollars in savings over 40 years. Can you briefly explain how that math works? Well, you have to look at what you're comparing that new system against. So it's clearly the transmission line will cost money to build and some money to operate. You compare that against operating a diesel system for say 40 years, and that involves capital for the diesel systems, local systems, and obviously the diesel fuel that you have to truck, barge, or fly in, and sometimes over ice roads. So when you compare those two costs, it appears that there is a strong savings possibility with transmission against, against the existing diesel system. That's what's leading the governments and the communities to want to go there, apart from the impact on energy and quality of life. Understood. Okay, Mitchell, our last few minutes here, uh, we need to get a better understanding of what all this could mean to the communities that are so far north of Thunder Bay. How could the grid connection also, in your view, unlock the potential for medium-sized energy projects in the future? Well, there's communities that have been looking at uh, some of these projects that are currently stranded because there's no transmission infrastructure to export the power to markets. So that some have done feasibility studies on uh, water power and, and other types of power that are scaled much larger than their community could use. And they'd like to, to pursue those projects and export that power to market and sell it into the Ontario's marketplace. Um, and there are quite a few communities that are looking at that, but I'm a bit cautious in that, you know, Ontario has to balance supply and demand and power. So if, if in our part of the province, if we have nowhere to export that power to a market where they're going to use it, uh, we're not going to get licensed to, to, to produce that power. So I think some, some communities who are first off the hop are going to be lucky 
and others uh, will not be so lucky uh, once uh, I think the marketplace is saturated with extra power. But if I've got this right, if your dream comes true, you're not only producing new sources of power, but you're selling them back to the grid as well and making some money on this. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, I'm interested in diversifying our supply mix right now. We look at rooftop solar. We look at small solar farms where we could uh, generate power f for ourselves uh, aside from diesel and work with our local distribution company. Uh, I don't necessarily have to wait for this transmission line to do that. I'm doing that now. But certainly uh, commercial scale projects will need transmission to unlock them. And Chris, getting all of these currently unhooked up communities onto the grid and hooked up with reliable clean energy, what impact would that have on them in your view? Well, I think if, if you look at a, when a province develops, say in Toronto or Ottawa, one of the first things the governments did is established an electricity system that put the wires and the power together and created reliable, safe, and often clean power that people could afford that allowed them to develop economically and have a lifestyle they could enjoy. Well, the same truth is absolutely true for the North. So that impact will absolutely be there if we can get grid-connected power. This is not going to be easy to do. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of communities, as you rightly pointed out, Steve. But I really think the timing is right. We, we want to impact climate change. If we can reduce diesel fuel, we have a huge reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And that coupled with the benefits of the, at the community level and the economic advantages that transmission appears to have against diesel makes the stars aligned. And Mitch, just in our last 30 seconds here, what could still go wrong? What's the obstacle that you're worried about the most? Right now, I'm worried about the parts, these moving parts that come first before we actually get power into our communities via this transmission line. And those parts I'm talking about involve impacts to lands, water, flora, and fauna. Those impacts are going to happen first as we construct this uh, transmission, all the corridors and the infrastructure. And the ties to the land are so intimate with the communities and the people in those communities that they're going to feel those impacts first before anything else, before they even get the power. And I think that uh, uh, will probably raise some, some flags with the communities uh, because we're talking about five kilometer wide corridors that we're planning right now for 1,500 kilometers. So 7,500 square kilometers of impacts. And um, they're thinking about that right now. So when I say the phase two EA is going to take a bit of time it's going to go pretty deep in, in terms of my, in my view, with engagement of the community and consultation. Gotcha. That's Mitchell Diabo from the Casabonica Lake First Nation, 500 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, and Christopher Henderson, the author of Aboriginal Power from our studio in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Gentlemen, it's good to have both of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.